So welcome to the Dr. Gundry podcast, and we're about to start a new year, and I thought it was really great that we could get a very distinguished physician, Dr. Laura Nassi, from Buenos Aires, Argentina, to join us. And she's got a recent book that came out in October, which is called Cancer as a Wake-Up Call. So thank you for joining us, and uh, welcome to the Dr. Gundry podcast. Thank you very much for inviting me and reaching out all the way to Argentina. Well, you're welcome. So your book, Cancer is a Wake-Up Call, you know, really presents a new way of looking at how we view and treat cancer. Now, cancer is a sensitive subject. So what's your approach in, in two ways? Number one, What's your approach in terms of thinking about cancer that perhaps is different than uh, those of us in the United States view it? You've done all of your training, most of your training in the United States at Temple University, uh, also at Sloan Kettering, and I know you were in Switzerland at Bern, and now you've been back in Argentina for 10 years. Mm -hmm. so, so tell me the various approaches. How should we think about cancer? How should, how do you think about cancer? Okay, so what I practice is this, um, is integrative oncology, what we call now integrative oncology, which is based on the scientific evidence that has uh, accumulated in the last decades from psychoneuroimmunology. I mean, the way we are seeing cancer from integrative oncology, it's a broadened way. It's, recognizing that what we've been calling cancer, it's we've, we've been only looking at, the, um, at that group of cells that divides uh, uncontrollably and, uh, you know, and, and gets the uh, phenotype, the, the capacity of invading locally or at a distance. But what we haven't looked at from conventional medicine is why do people, some people get cancer and why others don't? You know, for me, it's fascinating um, if we look at people who smoke, why do some people uh, smoke and get cancer? Why do some people smoke, then stop, quit smoking, and then get cancer years later? And why uh, some people that smoke don't, get, uh, don't ever get cancer? And what we know now from all the, uh, the research, uh, mainly from, from psychoneuroimmunology, is precisely that we are in contact with a lot of carcinogens during the day, you know, the sunlight and the pesticides and the tobacco or the air pollution and all those other chemicals who are in contact in our house, household or in the environment. But if our immune system is working well and our DNA repair systems are working well, so those cells that are uh, altered by the carcinogen get repaired or eliminated by the immune system and the DNA repair systems. But when, so when someone gets diagnosed of a cancer, we have to assume that that immune system and DNA repair system is not working well. And nowadays, we know that that, that immune system doesn't work by itself alone, but it's part of this network, of this intelligent network, psychoneuroimmune endocrine network, which what explains is that everything is connected within our body. So our emotional part, our thoughts and mainly how we perceive the world and how we translate that internally and how that affects our um, autonomic nervous system, that part of the nervous system that acts uh, automatically and it's right now, you know, controlling our heartbeat and our breathing rate, a rate of breathing and the glucose in our, in our blood and the temperature in our body. That uh, incredible system that it's working day and night without us having to give not even one order, no? Uh, it's, well, this uh, autonomic nervous system that works like with a gas pedal and a brake, a gas pedal and a brake, influences then the immune system and the endocrine system, the hormone system. So, I mean, women, we know it intuitively because we know that when we have some trauma or some stressful period, we know that something gets uh, uh, out of balance within our bodies, and then our menstruation, our menses are uh, uh, get you know delayed or or come before. So we know that something gets uh, out of balance within our body, and that affects all our hormones. Well, the same thing is happening with the immune system; it gets affected by how how we are internally. 
the only thing is that with the immune system, we don't see it. We don't see when it's working uh, badly, except when we start getting, you know, people that have a, a herpes in, in, you know, a mouth, uh, uh, what you call it, a lip herpes yeah, or, you know, cold sore. Of re reactivation of the whole, the cold sore. And they say, oh, maybe I'm stressed out because this happens when I'm stressed out. So we start seeing, uh, maybe we start having like indications that the immune system is not working well, but nowadays in our Western lifestyle, like we were uh, referring to uh, before this uh, interview, is that in our Western lifestyle, we just keep going, you know? We take some medicine and we keep going instead of listening what our immune system is saying. So what, what uh, from the psychoneuroimmunology point of view, when someone gets diagnosed with cancer, we also assume that there's a, an, an, a disbalance in this PNI network, in this psychoneuroimmunology network. Something is not working well. So we need to look not only at the tumor, but to look at the whole person and see how per that person is living and what's leading that person into a, a path of an unhealthy path that makes her or him more vulnerable to get sick. So the treatment. It's not only to go against the cancer cells, but how we can help that person to regain the health of that immune system and the whole PNI network. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. You know, it, most women with the BRCA1 or BRCA2 gene do not get cancer. The, mm -hmm. the vast majority don't. And mm -hmm. one of the things that I counsel my patients is just, just because you carry a gene that is potentially pro-cancer promoting has nothing to do with whether you personally are going to get those cancers. And, and you're absolutely right. It, it's this entire milieu uh, of the body. And I would throw in the, the gut immune brain axis. Uh, as you know, my interest is the microbiome. And uh, I think th the microbiome contributes so much to how our immune system functions. And I'm sure you would agree with that as well. Completely. I do refer to that in my book. And, and I think it's one of the things I'm stressing most, uh, you know, in the patients, in the recommendations. I mean, we, we're only starting to understand how the microbiome works, you know. But for example, in, within the microbiome, there's this, this whole strobolome, which is a the, the bacteria and the microorganisms that deal with our estrogens. So one person, you know, a, a woman who has an estrogen sensitive cancer, uh, not only, you know, we, we can help to lower the estrogen levels by medications, by removing the ovaries, etc., but also we can help a lot by the, the nutrition you know, and helping to uh, have a healthy estrobolome, which is a healthy group of bacteria that will help us uh, eliminate the estrogens through the gut, you know, through the, through the uh, fecal matter and not uh, reabsorb them. Because sometimes when there's an, a dys dysbiosis, an alt alteration in the microbiome, we, we, maybe we don't have, we're not consuming so many estrogens or producing so many estrogens, but whatever little we have, we are were circulating and reabsorbing again. So it's, it, a lot is presented in the blood all the time. So absolutely, the microbiome is something we don't understand so much yet, and it has a, a major impact. Yeah. So, so, when, when, so when you say, so let's, let's have a patient that comes to you with cancer, and you say that this is a wake-up call, and you've already you know, alluded to the fact that this is not just a tumor that's been picked up uh, or, you know, a growth someplace. So what's your approach to counseling that patient who comes to see you? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the title Cancer is a Wake Up Call comes as a result of so many patients I've seen where the, the diagnosis of cancer for them was really a life changing, you know, situation and allowed them to stop and, you know, really take, uh, become aware of how they were living and learn how to live, you know, in a more healthy and more happy way. And for them, it was really a wake up call into a more, into a more happy and healthy life. So really the, the, the title comes from observing that this happens, you know, 
that unfortunately nowadays, you know, even though we know that living stressfully is not good for us or eating unhealthy or not exercising is good, sometimes we don't make changes until we have, you know, some wake up call. And, and nowadays, cancer, unfortunately, I mean, on one side, unfortunately, it's what, you know, a lot of people, it's, it's, uh, it's what makes them wake up and stop living the unhealthy way they were living. But fortunately, in the sense that if we take cancer as this um, manifestation of an unbalanced disbalance within the body, then we can really look uh, not only at getting rid of the cancer, but, you know, having it as a, as a really wake up call to, to learn on how to live more healthy and more, more connected and more true to who we are, you know. And, and it's very interesting how things work because today I'm in my office. And the two patients I saw just before this interview, uh, the, one of them I have seen only once a year ago. And she's a young lady with, with she, she had had an early breast cancer, very good prognosis. But two years later, she had a metastatic disease in her back, in her back in one of her vertebra. And she came to see me at that point when she was completely, you know, uh, uh, anguished in anguish and despair because this had taken her completely out of uh, um, it, 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 she didn't expect something like this happening Shocked. to her yeah. Yeah. Shocked. And, uh, and I had that one consultation with her when I explained you know that cancer is really a group of cells manifesting and saying we don't want to continue this way you know this way of living there's something that you know and so I talked to her you know, what, what we know nowadays that to restore the health of that immune system of that PNI network, we need to address how we're living, how we're, you know, taking care of our body, not only how we're eating, but also how we're exercising, how we are sleeping, you know, it's very important for immune system. But also nowadays, we need to include some relaxation technique. We live in a very, in, at least in the Western world, we live with a lot of demand, a lot of stress, and we're just used to it, you know? People just say, oh, everybody's stressed out, or everybody, you know? But that's not an excuse, because this everybody stressed out is, is making us sick. I mean, the statistics say in, in, in the States, one every two men will have cancer in their, in their lifetime, and one every three women. I mean, there's something, the way we're living, that it's really making us vulnerable to, to get sick. So, and, and then I explained to her also how important it is to have, you know, to, to build, I, I talk about the team, you know, to build a good team to help one make all these changes. And, and those are like the basic um, recommendations, like for everybody. But then we have to look at that one person and why she got sick and what let her, you know, become sick. And this, in this case, this woman was a woman, you know, is a woman who's, very responsible. She has one part of herself that it's very responsible, that very much, you know, take everything on her own back sack, you know, and, and, and really uh, put everything, you know, for her, had a hard time to ask for help. And, and her life was, you know, just uh, being responsible and taking care of her kids, her husband, her profession, da, 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 da. So for her, I thought it was very important to do some psychotherapy to and 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 some other you know techniques and and practices uh, including relaxation practices to really understand who she is because that was one part of her the very responsible one but then she has a very much sensitive part that you know that has a lot to do with communication which is which is not developed in her and it's it's uh, it was really a pleasure because today she came I saw her at the beginning of the, no, one year ago, in December last year, and now I saw her for the, the second time. In the meantime, I was in contact with her psychotherapist and her nutritionist, etc. And she comes today and she's disease-free. You know, she was able, she got chemotherapy and radiation therapy to her back. Um, I mean, she got the, the conventional treatment, but she also did a lot of changes in her in her house, in her family. And, and so she, today she came to, kind of summarize all her her work during the last year and and it was so so it was such a pleasure to be a testimony you know how one person can make such a, a, a difference for herself for her for her family 
And on her case, being celebrating, being disease free, you know, after one year of of uh, of work, you know, with conventional medicine and all other things that she adopted, you know, to make her life more healthy. And she's happier. She feels more like herself. She feels, you know, like she she's not just that, uh, um, you know, kind of a soldier just keeping, you know, the orders, but just living a more more plentiful life more you know and and this for me it's uh, it's it's really amazing and and you know this woman started her journey when she came to see me one year ago and this is how I wrote the book I had this people who really are able to listen and to become aware and to make changes just for, if, if they understand if they're giving the the important information, you know, on the way we're living and how it affects us. And so I had some of these cases, just that with one consultation, they were able to make a big change. And that's when I decided, okay, I'll write everything in a book. And then so that it's available for everyone, you know, who can come to consultation or not, but they can really get the information they need to understand that Cancer, treating cancer is not just, just going to the chemo, radiation, or the surgery, but there's a lot of things we can do about how we're living and changes we can do to live a more healthy lifestyle. So, so th that brings up two, two points and two questions for me. Uh, you're, you're trained originally as you know, a medical oncologist, a c conventional medicine uh, like, like I was, and a trained in conventional surgical oncology uh, for the chest. And that, so if somebody comes to you with cancer and says, I know you're an alterna alternative medicine doctor, uh, I want to know, I don't want conventional therapy. Um, you know, I want alternative therapy. What say you to that person? Yeah, I, I have a, a patient I I, uh, I um, wrote in my book. You know, she came with a with a single lung nodule, and she said, "I come to you because I know you're not." Um, she used a word in Spanish like you don't like to use knives, like you're not pro surgery. You know. And I said, no, 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 don't misunderstand. I said, first of all, I, I always explain I'm integrative oncology. I think there is a role for conventional medicine. And I don't think that everybody needs to get chemotherapy until the end of the day, uh, the, their days. And not everybody needs all the, the whole treatment. But yes, there is a role for surgery, for radiation therapy, for chemotherapy, for hormotherapy, immune therapy. I, I mean, but what I, what I propose is broadening the view. I'm not thinking only about the tumor itself, but uh, really focusing on what led that person become vulnerable to disease and what you know, he or she can change. So this particular patient I mentioned in the book is precisely, I said, look, you, I mean, you need to understand that you're in an incredible position that they have diagnosed and they have found you know, that one solitary nodule without, by, by chance, without having any symptoms. And that's, a, you know, it's something, it's surgically uh, removable. And you're in a, uh, in a very special location because a lot of people, when they find their lung cancer, it's not operable anymore. And well, and then I explained the whole thing I just explained to you on how really what we need to work is in what made her vulnerable to, to get sick and how she needed to treat uh, in in herself, there was a there was a big emotional issue, and you know she had had very uh, uh, loss of of very dear people, uh, too many in a row, and and she really needed to work on how to deal, you know, uh, differently with losses, and not just you know put it all in in, in her body. And so she she worked with psychotherapy and. Uh, and uh, relaxation techniques and other techniques, you know, for self uh, getting to know herself better and, 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 and learning how to deal better with her emotions and, and her relationships. Yeah, and that, and that actually brings up my second question. So somebody who comes in with cancer, uh, I think some of our listeners are going to say, well, what you're saying is you got cancer and 
enjoy yourself. And they're probably going, what do you mean enjoy myself? You know, I've just been told I have cancer and you're telling me to have a great day. Uh, how, do we, how do we make that leap of faith? Mm. Well, uh, I mean, one of the issues is that there's more and more scientific data to validate that positive emotions affect positively. You know, when I our, our system, you know, when I was explaining about this PNI network and the neural part that works with a with a, a, a gas pedal and a brake, a gas pedal that's a sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system, yeah, uh, and the the way we perceive the world, if we perceive the world with uncertainty and we, and we don't feel, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, good with ourselves and we are afraid of what's coming, we'll be inside of us, it's like pressing on that gas pedal and uh, activating all the stress response that, you know, whenever there's a situation of uncertainty of, that makes us afraid, our body prepares itself to, you know, to act, yeah? But, uh, and then when we can relax, we, it's like pressing on that brake, and then we produce uh, the relaxation response, which has a completely different uh, cascade of chemical substances. So how we perceive the world and what, how we translate it, translates physically in different cascade of substances, either stressful substances or uh, repair and relaxation substances. And usually we can't have both at the same time. You know, we can't have uh, a, a, a stress cascade being activated as well as the parasympathetic and all the relaxation. So the more we press on that break, the more we do relaxation techniques, the more we enjoy ourselves, the more we, um, yeah, we really enjoy w with our bodies, you know, go for a, for a good dance and, or, or, or chanting or, you know, music and, and, and celebrating our body, the more we are producing uh, substances that will help for our repair, you know, for our, uh, re recovering our health. So really what we do translates chemically inside our bodies. And we need to understand that because we need to understand that if we, if we put ourselves, you know, eight hours a day, I'm sorry, I don't know if you hear, but there's a great thunderstorm at this point here in Buenos Aires. It's a really, yeah. We can hear um, a bit of it, but it's okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so, so nowadays we know that you know if we if we put ourselves eight hours a day in an environment where we don't where we feel threatened, we feel afraid. I mean, that's the chemistry that will be bathing all our body and our organs throughout the day, you know, and to compensate for that, you know, we, we, re, we would really need to, to work on, on pressing on the, you know, coming back home and having a massage and doing some meditation and, and having a nice talk with uh, our partner or going for, with friends out and uh, having a good laugh, you know, to compensate for all the other chemistry we've been building up during the day. So it's not just uh, blah, blah that we need to enjoy. Enjoy means we need to work on our internal pharmacy, you know, on our internal uh, chemistry. Yeah, uh, Norman Vincent Peale uh, was famous for uh, curing himself of cancer by uh, watching a funny movie every day and uh -huh. uh, making himself laugh. And, and certainly uh, I agree that laughter is uh, one, of, one of the keys of changing our environment. In fact, I, I even know a, uh, a yoga uh, instructor who's called the laughing yogi because laughing yogi. yeah, because yeah. all he does is laugh during yoga, yeah. and th yeah. that, that's yeah. actually very hard to do, I think. But uh, he's he's trained me to do it. So, <laughs> so, so help us understand. So I, you know, I've got the diagnosis of cancer and. I've uh, decided that I'm going to listen to conventional medicine. I'm going to do chemotherapy and radiation therapy. So uh, who else do I have to get on my team? I'm not in a center that has uh, complementary medicine. How do I take charge of 
getting my team assembled? Yeah. I think we're, we're coming to understand that medicine should be more and more personalized. Personalized meaning really focused on the person. So in order for me to be able to recommend, why recommend, you know, reflexology or acupuncture or yoga or meditation to you, I need to understand who you are. I need to get to know you. So I will take at least an hour to ask you about everything, you know. First of all, if you, you know, your medical history and just to get a feeling whether there have been like flashes, you know, alert systems in your body already telling you you were getting sick. And also that gives me an idea on how long you've been, your immune system have, has been declining, you know, a lot of times, you know, with a history, but with, with a medical history. But of course, I will ask also about the psychosocial, how that person, you know, with whom he or she lives, how are her relationships that she really, how is the climate at home? Does she really find or him, you know, finds a, a good place where to rest and, 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 and relax and be him or herself? I will ask about the, you know, the group of friends. How is the climate at work? If, if, if he or she has a, a work, if she's recognized at work, if she's, you know, compensated. And, um, and also I will ask about, you know, the, their, 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 their wishes and their, you know, what, what, what's, you know, there's things that this person has been wishing for and, you know, has never accomplished the pending, you know, and, and also I, I will ask a little bit, I mean, also to get an idea of how, how this person has been, uh, really from the intrauterine life, you know, from when we were in the, the belly of our uh, mothers, because there's data nowadays to show that whatever we, we live in, uh, when we are in the belly of our mothers in the intrauterine life, and also in the first seven years of infancy, that affects our, you know, our genome. I mean, not the genome itself, but the epigenetics, like which which um, which genes we activate and what, which ones we turn on and which ones we turn off. And nowadays, we know that the childhood, the the, the stressful childhood uh, experiences leave some epigenetic changes that may be silent for a, a while and then they are um, they are uh, uh, uncovered when we are adults and we have you know some more stress and unhealthy habits and then all this comes up you know just turning the whole pni system you know into disbalance so um i i would need to get like you know if i know that this is a person that had some abuse or some you know uh, uh, adverse childhood experiences, I, I can only, uh, I can already uh, see how this person will react or overreact to situations more with a stressful, you know, and will need to, uh, and will need to, to um, focus even more on anti, you know, on relaxation and anti-stress techniques. So, so it will be very personalized. I don't believe in the one, you know, one formula for everybody. Yes, we need to look into how we eat, if we exercise, how we sleep, our social support, our relaxation, but uh, then it's very personalized for, for it, you so, know. So speaking of eating, my treatment of cancer uh, certainly uh, goes with eating. So sev several points. Number one, uh, I see a, a number of women with breast cancer, for instance, who are postmenopausal. Mm -hmm. And one of the, I think, fallacies that I've seen is that they are assured that they have no estrogen production, and yet they're overweight or frequently obese. And I can show them in their lab results that in fact they make lots of estrogen. Right. And they, they're, you know, they're incredulous. And they said, no, I, I don't because I'm in menopause. And then I you know, show them and I said, well, that's funny. You, you have lots of estrogen in your body. And there's certainly good evidence in, in breast cancer that women who are overweight or obese at the time of their initial treatment who remain overweight or obese have a much higher recurrence rate mm -hmm. than women who lose weight and their estrogen levels fall as well as their insulin uh, falls. Right. So uh, the other thing that I uh, 
I do. Uh, I, I do think that cancer has, has a metabolic derangement feature. I, I do think that there's a mitochondrial dysfunction. And uh, so my job is I, I use a ketogenic diet and an extremely high fat, an extremely low protein diet on these people. And I, if I had cancer, uh, I would not eat animal protein uh, because of the amino acids that are more present in animal protein than plant protein that are known that cancer cells can utilize. So, uh, so that's kind of my approach to uh, cancer patients, and I have a very large cancer practice, and knock on wood, we've had, you know, really good results um, with this. Uh, so... Can I, I, can I ask a question? Yeah. I, I, are you able to, to recommend the ketogenic diet uh, plant-based and, 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 you know, avoiding, because yes. usually that's, it's a... Uh, Good. Yeah, I, ask. yeah I, think that's, I think that's the major mistake that people associate with a ketogenic diet or a paleo diet. Um, these, are, these are all variations of basically the Atkins diet. And people think that a high protein diet, is, avoiding carbohydrates, uh, and keeping the fat that's associated with animal protein is a ketogenic diet. And I measure ketones in, in all of my patients, and the vast majority of patients that I see who say they're on a ketogenic diet, in fact, aren't, because they're eating primarily a heavy protein diet. And this was actually one of the mistakes that, that Dr. Adkins made, and, and I know because my original book uh, Dr. Gundry's Diet Evolution was done by Random House, who had done all the Adkins diets and all the South Beach diet books. And Dr. Adkins didn't know that we, we have no real storage system for protein. Um, we need it for wear and repair, but that's about it. So we don't waste energy. So we convert protein into sugar, gluconeogenesis. And he actually died a fat man. I, I know because I actually take care of his head nurse. Um, and he didn't know this. And so many people in the ketogenic community uh, don't know that protein will turn into sugar. So to get back to your question, I, I basic t basically tell my patients that I want them to become a gorilla who lives in Italy. Now, you have to think about that for a second. Uh, gorillas only eat leaves and twigs. And why I want them to live in Italy, because I want them to consume a liter of olive oil per week. Uh, and that's a huge amount of olive oil. It's about 12 to 14 tablespoons a day. But there's a very interesting Spanish study of 65-year-old people who were followed for four years. And I'll briefly summarize it. One group had to have a liter of olive oil per week for four years and have a Mediterranean diet. A second group ate a low-fat Mediterranean diet. And the original study was to look at memory, and I'll forget about that. But the women in the olive oil group had a 67% less incidence of breast cancer over that time period than the women in the low-fat Mediterranean diet. So uh, I think, so if you eat a liter of olive oil per week and avoid animal proteins, you're basically on about an 80% fat diet. And the carbohydrates that you're eating are basically leaves as a mechanism to get olive oil into your mouth. So that's what I do with my patients. Now, I'm not successful entirely. A lot of people will not give up animal protein. But the more I can diminish animal protein, the more successful uh, I am with this program. And uh, among other things, what I want to do is get the gut bacteria participating mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. educating the immune system. Mm -hmm. so, um, so talk to me about where you think nutrition is in the scheme of cancer fighting. 
Well, I think one uh, one of, uh, nutrition is one of the pillars of recovering, you know, your immune system and your whole DNI network. Um, personally, from the research I've done, I mean, the, there is um, there is no uh, real evidence that one diet is, you know, or a very restrictive diet is better than a healthy diet. This is my my taking up, um, than a, a, a healthy diet, like I propose in the book, you know, with less um, animal uh, fat and less animal yeah, protein and more plant-based and uh, decreased sugars and uh, changing, you know, the, um, the flour for, you know, like uh, uh, complete flour. And uh, I also opt for the rice to be complete, although I know that you have a different view in some uh, uh, parts. But to tell you the truth, I think that uh, we still don't know a lot about diet. I think, I think you're completely right that we need to think about diet, not so much what we need, but what our bacteria need, you know, like what our microbiome biome needs. And also I think that that will depend a lot on each person. Because uh, I, I believe we will be going into a more personalized type of diet also. It's not, you know, ketogenic for everybody or low, you know, protein for everybody or whatever. I mean, there are certain things we know. We know that all the processed foods that have, you know, uh, come up in the last decades and the, the last century, uh, plus all the sugary drinks and sugary things. I mean, we know that that's not good for us. And all the additives, we know that that's not good. We need to go to a, to a more... Uh, but then I believe that we will be looking at more uh, personalized. It's not that all cancer patients need the same diet. Uh, there, There is even data about some studies with ketogenic diet and pancreas cancer and glioblastoma and brain tumor. So, I mean, uh, but I don't think uh, it's ketogenic for everybody. I don't, I don't believe from the data I've seen. Uh, and, and personally also, you know, I, a lot of the things I recommend, I, I try them myself first, you know, and not the chemotherapy or the radiation. But, but, no, but, uh, you know, as far as nutrition and relaxation techniques and all these types of uh, uh, treatments and practices, I, I do practice them myself to see what it does to my body and then I can recommend them with more uh, emphasis or not. And I think that the diet, uh, it, it has to be personalized. As I was saying before, it's not the same a, a woman, a postmenopausal woman who has high estrogens and we maybe we need to be focusing more on that strobolome and see how that, how, uh, and not to feed the bacteria that will cut that glucuronization, you know, in the gut and, 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 and permit, allow the, the enterohepatic circulation of estrogens. And maybe that, that won't be the focus for a patient with a lung cancer and other characteristics, you know. Okay. So you, you encounter in your practice, and I certainly do in mine, a person who has end-stage cancer. Um, mm -hmm. What... What advice, how do you change your technique counseling for that person? Mm -hmm. From the integrative point, uh, the integrative, uh, you know, paradigm, um, it's interesting because integrative oncology not only incorporates the information that comes from psychoneuroimmunology, but also from other theories that uh, that were formulated last century. What I'm talk talking about, uh, about systems theory and chaos theory, you know, that bring and, and quantum physics and relatively uh, relative uh, theory that that makes us change the, the the perception, you know, of of how how we perceive the world. So if we adopt, you know, what chaos theory tells us um, uh, and, and system theory you know, tells us is that we are an open system and we're in continuous interaction with our media and with our environment and we others around. If this system, if we, if we think the system is closing up, you know, and, and dying and, and we declare this is, this is how it is, it's most probable that we will be 
doing things to close it down, you know. And uh, uh, I wrote another book, which is called uh, Cancer and Psychoneuroimmunology, and I wrote it for, you know, it's in Spanish only uh, still. But uh, I wrote it with a psychologist who's been working in Euroway with this in, in integrated view for the last 20 years. And what we explained there is that, you know, we, according to the chaos theory, if we are an open system, we cannot predict how the, the outcome will be. You know, in medicine, we believe we know the outcomes, but then we treat 10 patients with the same disease with the same treatment, and then we know that some respond and some don't respond, and we don't understand it. But we think we know what the outcome is. And we also know from chaos theory is that little changes in the system may make, you know, bigger changes. And uh, so I always, when I, when I see a patient, you know, who's with a more advanced disease and what we call, you know, end stage, or I... I always leave one window of, of, of hope, you know, because we really don't know. There are some testimonies of people who were about to die and did not die. So who are we to say that person will die? If we say that person will die, that, pro that person probably will say, okay, I'll eat whatever because I'm dying. I won't exercise because I'm dying. It doesn't matter how I treat my, the other ones because I'm dying. So it will go closing by itself, you know. So I propose the same integrated view. It's, I tell them it's like a, a, a plant that is wilting, you know. And we know that we need to do a lot of strategies, you know, that plant's not just pouring water, it's seeing what the plant needs to see if we can revitalize it again. And so the, the focus is there, always keeping a foot on, on the ground, like saying things are not easy, you know, and if this has been deteriorating for a while, we cannot expect that with one measure you, you know, revitalize again. But yes, we, we need to leave uh, uh, some hope and, uh, and of course, emphasize, you know, on whatever brings that person peace and, and, and some type of a pleasure moment and whatever can stimulate that system, you know, uh, continue doing it because we are not who to say when that person will die or not. And yes, focus on uh, accompanying that person in the most humane and caring and loving way. And, and, and then let life decide, you know, how, how things uh, keep going. This is my, this is my uh, you know, the, the way I, 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 I propose it and take it. Okay. And of course, I had people who recover and, 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 you know, there are some people who who were, uh, you know, according to, to conventional medicine, uh, you know, thought that we can't do anything more. And then you see them, you know, I had a, a, um, a patient with metastatic lung cancer and, you know, everybody, uh, it was like 10 years ago. So th there were very fewer options of treatment and they thought, you know, this, this person was not going to do well. And, and, you know, he lived like five you know, very plentiful years, which for that stage, it was a lot. And, you know, and I, I had patients with metastatic uh, breast cancer to the brain who really also uh, lived over a year of a very, you know, uh, uh, kind of pleasurable life in the sense that they were able to travel and, you know, do some, you know, get some. So we cannot tell how, how one person will go or not. And uh, I, I think the... Um, the approach is similar, uh, just recognizing that things are more difficult. No, that it's a more difficult situation. Okay. Well, I think that's a very good place to, to wrap this up, a uh, very good place to end. Uh, as part of every one of my podcasts, I, I answer a question from our, our listeners. So if you'll bear with me before we sign off, I'm going to answer a question. Okay? Sure. All right. Sure. Uh, so this is the audience question, and it's from E. Uh, I heard your podcast today, very informative stuff, and thanks for sharing. I request your opinion on stomach ulcers, and what would you recommend with healing? Actually, that's a really good question, E. Uh, 
there's uh, a lot of options with stomach ulcers. Now, uh, I'm not sure if you're referring to ulcers that are associated with the bacteria H. pylori. Uh, we do know that H. pylori certainly is a cause of stomach and duodenal ulcers. But I'm going to throw in just a little uh, wild card. Uh, we know that H. pylori is actually a normal bacterium of the stomach. And there's some physicians, Dr. Blazer from New York City, who actually thinks that H. pylori is actually a good organism that is part of the natural uh, rainforest of our bacteria. And I agree with him that things like C. difficile, which causes, you know, horrible intestinal uh, inflammation and diarrhea, uh, is a normal bacteria, which is normally kept in check by all of the other 10,000 bacteria. And it's the same with H. pylori. I don't think it's the demon that it has been made out to be. So I don't necessarily think that you need an antibiotic treatment for H. pylori. If you want to do that, I have nothing against it. But what I would rather do is get the acid medium of the stomach back to normal. And there's an excellent supplement called Betaine. You may see it as TMG, capital T, capital M, capital G, trimethylglycine. And this will actually increase the hydrochloric acid of your stomach. The other thing is both probiotics and more importantly prebiotics to feed the friendly bacteria will absolutely change the entire milieu in your stomach. Finally, lectins are one of the major causes of breaking down the mucosal barrier. If you have a history of canker sores or what are called athesis ulcers in your mouth, I can guarantee you, having had them most of my life until I realized that lectins were the cause, those things are happening on the inside of your stomach and in the inside of your intestines. So get lectins out of your life, and you already know what lectins are. If not, check out one of my other podcasts or get the plant paradox. So thanks for that question, really good question. So, Dr. Nasty, thanks so much for joining me. Uh, this has been really great, and I appreciate what you're doing. You're absolutely, I think, on the right track. Where, where can my audience find out more about you and get your book? Oh, thank you. Um, uh, I have a, in, in the media, in the social media, I have a, a, a blog for Cancer is a Wake Up Call, and there I have uh, information about myself and how to contact me and and I have an Instagram and a Twitter also where I put some information and there's information I was supposed to some of the talks I gave uh, during my book tour uh, last October. I was in, at MD Anderson and at Sloan Kettering and I was at the Gilded Club in New York. So I, I did a little tour and in California as well at UCSF. Um, so uh, some of the talks are also posted there to, to explain a little bit what I explained uh, today. Uh, some of them are more scientific for professionals and some for, for patients as well. So I think that that's the best way to, to get to know about my book and what I do. Great. Thank you very, well, thank you very much for, for this conversation. It has been very uh, easy for me, and uh, thank you for, for reaching out. Our, our pleasure. And so that does it for the Dr. Gendry podcast today. As I said, there's a new year starting in a few days. And just because you've been told you have cancer, it's time to make a new you in the new year. Because I'm Dr. Gendry, and I'm always looking out for you.